in the name of urban renewal. Slum clearance is the term used to destroy Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. During the colonial era, French settlers farmed the area and called it Black Bottom for its dark fertile soil and low elevation. In the 20th century, Black Bottom and Paradise Valley became one of the most vibrant African-American districts in Detroit. In the early 1900s, many African-Americans migrated north to Detroit seeking employment in the city's growing automotive industries. Racially discriminative housing covenants forced most of them to settle in the area called Black Bottom, altering the connotation of the district's name. As thousands of blacks moved into Black Bottom, the community became a vibrant culture. The district reached its social, cultural peak 1920s. Blacks owned over 350 businesses in Detroit, most within Paradise Valley and Black Bottom. The community additionally had 17 physicians, 22 lawyers, 13 dentists, 11 tailors, 10 restaurants, 10 realtors, 8 grocers, 6 drug stores, 5 undertakers, 4 employment agencies, 1 candy maker, and a business making Venetian blinds. The number of blacks moving into the district continued to increase with the promise of available industrial jobs. Increased demands for housing in Black Bottom allow landlords to charge exuberant rents for units in extreme despair. Following the stock market crash in 1929, the United States entered the Great Depression. Soaring unemployment rates of the 1930s remain unparalleled in American history. President Franklin D. Roosevelt attempted to ameliorate the high unemployment rate and extreme housing conditions of many working class African Americans through his New Deal initiatives. For thousands of blacks living in Black Bottom, this meant the construction of the Brewster Housing Projects, the nation's first public housing development. Securing a site for the proposed housing development was not a simple process. White Detroiters built political alliances to stop construction of the development near their neighborhoods. Consequently, construction of the development put many blacks back to work and gave black bottom citizens hope for decent living conditions. Well, I grew up uh, pretty close to this river uh, when I first came to Detroit in the early 20s, uh, 1923, as a matter of fact. I lived at St. Alban and Antietam, not too far from Joe Muir's. We all attended the same schools. Uh, in my case, uh, Duffield. I went briefly to Barstow, to Capron, to St. Mary's. Uh, to Miller, and then to Eastern. Uh, people moved an awful lot because these were hard times in the main, uh, depression times mostly, uh, but largely within the same neighborhood. Uh, the black community had not begun to expand dramatically uh, as it did later on. As we approached World War II, it began to explode because workers from all over the South, uh, black and white, were coming to Detroit uh, in the late 30s uh, to work in the auto plants and uh, to participate in the booming uh, defense industries that were centered in Detroit. As a matter of fact, uh, when I went to the Army in 1942, some 20 years after I'd come to the city, uh, I left from St. Alvin and Maple uh, in Black Bottom and uh, my family lived there uh, right up until uh, the end of the war when we moved further east. Uh, Black Bottom uh, is the area of Detroit, uh, generally south of Gratiot, uh east of Hastings Street, what is now Chrysler Expressway, and extending all the way over to Mount Elliott. 
the sort of triangular pie-shaped uh, piece of land, and of course the southern boundary was the river. Uh, the oldest black community in the city of Detroit was located uh, in Black Bottom. Across Gratiot and to the north uh, was Paradise Valley, Hastings Street, and another old segment of the black community in Detroit. Uh, there was one other sizable uh, black community in the 20s and 30s, and that was the west side. Uh, these were the principal uh, black communities uh, in the early days. There were smaller communities in Conant Gardens and the north end, uh, as we call it. But the basic one were the east side, divided between Hastings Street and Black Bottom, and the west side. A major point of attraction, and as we talk about the 1920s, we are talking about the first major decade of what we have typically called the great migrations or the great black migrations. Um, you have a lot of things that are happening in the 19, in, in the second decade of the 20th century. Um, you have uh, a major one being the issue of war. Um, World War I does bring a halt to the secession or to the to the migration of a number of European immigrants. That opens up a need for um, uh, jobs or that opens up a need for workers. And the newly emerging automotive industry, and of course the major force there would be, would be Henry Ford, uh, is making a direct appeal for workers, many of whom will be African Americans, coming out of the rural south. And they come to Detroit. Detroit, like all other cities at that point in time, uh, has a racial profile to it. Uh, blacks just can't come anywhere and, and, and live anywhere in Detroit. They have to live in certain areas. One of the areas that um, is developing in the at, right at the point of the end of World War One is Paradise Valley, uh, or is what will first be called Black Bottom. Black Bottom, which was a historic black neighborhood, it's no longer called that. This whole neighborhood has a number of different names, Lafayette Park, Shane Gardens, there's all kind of names for this area. But all of this would have been Black Bottom, which would have been the primary residential neighborhood for black people and from the early 1900s to the 1960s. Um, this was the major school there. This was started out as Sidney Miller Middle School. So it was named Sidney Miller Middle School, and it was a middle school. However, Black Bottom wasn't named Black Bottom because of the black residents. It was named that because of the soil. The Savoy River runs all through this neighborhood, the lower east side of the city of Detroit. But you know it now as the DeQuinder Cut. That was once a river that ran all the way through, had a lot of branches through Black Bottom, and it deposited this black soil all over this neighborhood. And so it was named Black Bottom because of the ground, this black rich soil that existed in this neighborhood. Um, and so you had numbers of group, other ethnic groups that lived among black people in this neighborhood. The Germans, when they first come to Detroit, Jewish people, Italians, Irish, Polish, Greeks, all of them lived in the lower east side of Detroit, either in the same neighborhood as African Americans or very close to the neighborhood that African Americans lived in. And in the 1920s, you had, from 1910 to 1920, the, the population of black people in the city of Detroit rose 600 percent. In the 1920 census you had 600 percent more African Americans living in the city of Detroit than you had in the 1910 census. So many African Americans were coming to Detroit and they were all for the most part forced to live in this neighborhood. The other white ethnic groups began to discriminate against black people in the same neighborhood and so they didn't want black people to go to Eastern High School anymore. So Eastern High School becomes segregated in 1932. It becomes a segregated high school. Eastern is for whites. Sidney Miller Middle School becomes Sidney Miller High School. So now this would be the high school for black people. So it was a middle school. It was meant for middle school. It becomes a high school. And black people, this Duffield becomes our elementary for African Americans. And Sidney Miller becomes our middle and high school. But of course it develops some of the best programs, particularly in music, and sports. So African Americans excel in those areas because they have the best teachers, the best coaches, the best singers, the best musicians teaching them how to do these crafts. And those musicians and those uh, artists 
those singers, they become many of the performers in Paradise Valley. So Sydney Miller now, it closed as a Detroit public school. It is now um, University Prep Science and Math School and Mosaic Youth Theater also has their headquarters here in this building. Um, but this was the historic Sydney Miller High School. Eastern High School desegregates again in the 1960s and then later in the 70s they changed their name to Martin Luther King High School. Okay. I'm the one for shit that was bothering the watch yeah. that I know. I don't care what nationality you was, your festival was having high fashion. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, I was born okay. and raised here. I'm okay. uh, you know 50, uh, 52 years old. So. Okay, okay. So, we exchange business cards, so when you uh, they get this door, maybe we'll do a story on it. Okay? Good, all good, right. that's right. Hey, really now this is my saying, it's always a treat when real folks be. <laughs> Isn't that nice? That's right, all good right. to see you. So, Stars above, love on, love on. If there's something you wanna say, and talking is the only way. Rap on, rap on. Cause whatever. I hope it's just not a band-aid for giving a little something to African Americans. Because Paradise Valley, it appears that it, uh, it, is a, it is a few entities there that I don't know about the structure of how the deal was, uh, came up with, but I do think it's a start to make sure African Americans are part of the new development in the city of Detroit. Do I think it's the answer to everything? No, I do not. It could serve as a band-aid to say, look what I did for them. So I think we uh, need to be careful and hope that we can look for more development and everything up for African Americans participation. This one Detroit should include everyone in Detroit. This is the first time in six months I've agreed with Tony. Much of anything. But I, but I, 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 I do I, I do agree. I don't want it to be considered like Greek town or Mexican town or something. I mean we don't need an um. ethnic district this city needs equal opportunities for everybody to be entrepreneurs wherever it is in the city, and the sh city should not lose sight of that. I, I, I agree with Tony. It's a great project as long as you're not limiting in your mind, this is for the black folks, now we're going to go do this. Uh, it, it, that should not be, no, and I'm not suggesting mean. that it is. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting that that's not an end-all, be-all. Um, exactly. that's, that's, that's a good spot, and I, you know, I think the history says you know, it, it brings back Detroit history and all of that. But I'm more concerned about the opportunities throughout the city for um, people of color, whether it's black or uh, Hispanic, to be able to have an equal shot, of a, a, a competitive opportunity to help build the strength in communities out there. Because, you know, now, it, it, in a way, it's a blessing. You can't find office space downtown. You can't find parking spaces downtown. Well, it's also getting that way with residences. I mean, we can talk about yeah. the cost of it. But the good part about it, that's making people want to go out into the communities to find a reasonably priced home and be there. So let's give them what they need when they get there. They've got to have community shopping. They've got to have groceries. They've got to have public safety. But you can repopulate the city if you build the infrastructure around those communities. Mm -hmm. the, the, the houses are there. Right. You know, and I think we need to, it, when we start building those communities, then you get the establishment opportunities around it for the businesses that people don't want to drive all the way downtown or to Midtown for. Yeah, but Cliff, isn't it amazing how well the executive looks today? And I also see he's wearing gaiters now, so I guess we'll be carrying gaiters 
Uh, These aren't gators. Gators. It looked like gators to me. I mean, well, they look like gators. <laughs> <laughs> not but it's still got that swag of Detroit. Huh? Yeah, okay. But I just <laughs> anybody to think I could afford $600 shoes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's the only point I'm trying to make clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. In an yeah. offhanded sort of way, that was a compliment. That was. That was. That was. <laughs> <laughs> I had shared earlier with you that you asked me, did the county exec know about Paradise Valley and didn't know about Black Bottom and I was sharing with you that he has much more history on those things than I because I was such a young lad. I just <laughs> missed I just missed out but I've heard that there were black business in the city of Detroit. Coleman Young was raised in the city in Black Bottom and the energy of black business is working together with as well as Italians and Greeks is what I was heard. What made up Black Bottom and then all of a sudden 75 came through or one of the freeways came through which eliminated but also in that what was always strange to me it came through Black Bottom and destroyed Black Bottom, but Stroh said, we're not moving. So they built that freeway that destroyed Black Bottom and went around Crow, a Stroh's brewery. So what I'm saying to say, and that's what we're talking about, table talk here, we must speak up for our communities. We must engage in the process because I'm really tired of us complaining after the situation. I believe that we have enough influence, and I've learned in my, uh, me and Cliff's, uh, 30 some years of ownership and business that we can speak up and truly make a difference. I'm seeing development out here but we're engaged in the process of that development. Someone should have been more engaged in the process of, de of destroying Black Bottom just like they had the enthusiasm to speak up for Strohs. If we stand up for who we are, I truly believe that our community can be better off and represent all of Detroit, not just part of Detroit. Warren Evans is not just the CEO of Wayne County, he's one of the most powerful African Americans in this country. There are very few Wayne, uh, there are very few county executives that happen to be African American. Most recently, the consent decree that was forced on them has been removed. So we are in a very unique position in Michigan, and I certainly hope that African Americans in Detroit, African Americans in Wayne County, don't forget the legacy of people like Coleman Alexander and Young. The most special characteristic of the people of this city is their warmth, a warmth uh, that's not a weak warmth because it's warmth and strength, the ability to reach out to one's neighbor and to care for the city and for your neighbor, and the strength at the same time and belief in yourself, belief in your city, to persevere in the face of uh, incredible hardship. 